Our first lesson this morning comes from the Hebrew scriptures, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 12. Hear these words from the New Revised Standard Version. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Our second lesson this morning comes from the Christian scriptures, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Hear are these words from Eugene Peterson's The Message. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on a pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified and not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah wrote it plainly. It's you Bethlehem in Judah's land no longer bringing up the rear. From you will come the leader who will shepherd, rule my people, my Israel. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east. Pretending to be as devout as they were, he got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, go find this child. Leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word, and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshiped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, come to us in the quietness of this very moment. 
center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us that your love, mercy, and grace come to us unasked for and free. Amen. Well, the, the Revised Common Lectionary sometimes plays tricks on pastors. You see, there are 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany, and it is recommended that the church celebrates Epiphany on the Sunday closest to the 12th day, January 6th. Now, you'll recall last year, Rod McDonald led worship celebrating Epiphany with us on January 3rd. So what's the problem, you ask? Well, today is the closest Sunday to Epiphany, January 6th, and there are distinct readings for Epiphany. But the lectionary also keeps the assigned readings for January 9th. So, and those readings are Jesus' baptism. So I could either overlook Epiphany, or I could overlook the baptism, unless you want me to deliver two messages. <laughs> I didn't think so. Well, our Christian Century conversation group from this past Monday um, discussed Epiphany. So we'll go that route. Uh, but not to worry, not to worry. Um, we won't be forgetting Jesus' baptism. We'll just push that to next week. And particularly because my message from last year uh, was kind of overshadowed by the events at the U.S. Capitol. So, put a plug in that. So, here we are, nine days into January 2022. And more than likely, our Christmas decorations have been put away for a long, long time before now, I'm sure, right? I saw a meme on Facebook um, that it was earlier this month, a photograph of Lady Mary Crawley from the British drama Downton Abbey, which had the caption, let's see if I can channel Mary Crawley here, the tree stays up until epiphany, you'll soon get used to the way things are done here properly. <laughs> Thus our tree stands today properly. <laughs> but you know, Christmas seems like a distant memory now, doesn't it? We're a long way from the manger. And here we are hearing, again, a message from the gospel that tells us a piece of the Christmas story. Is there a place for this child of God, this, this Christ child, in a world such as ours? Can we believe in a redeemer in the midst of a world that is clearly, clearly not yet redeemed? Well, I would say that we are charged with making Christ relevant to those around us. But we need a little help making the connection between the manger and the world as we know it today. Epiphany is a Greek word meaning appearances. The Feast of Epiphany started in the Eastern Church in honor of Jesus' baptism, the scripture readings that we'll read next week. And Epiphany was introduced to the West in the fourth century. So we've only been doing this since the fourth century, where it became associated with the visit of the Magi. Now, in some parts of the world, families exchange gifts on January 6th instead of on Christmas Day because Epiphany celebrates the coming of the wise men and the gifts they brought. Now, the Greek Orthodox Church um, observes January 6th as their Christmas Day. Now, Matthew's account of Jesus' birth connects Jesus to Moses and the experience of Israel. God's revelation to Joseph in dreams, and it is those dreams that guides Matthew's story, reminding us that the, the Hebrew scriptures Joseph was a dreamer. 
Pharaoh killed Israelite children. Herod killed the children of Bethlehem. Moses led Israel out of Egypt. And Jesus was taken in exile to Egypt before being coming back to the promised land. So we're all familiar with the, the story of the wise men. And we have a sense of what the story is about. But before I go any further, though, I, I want to touch um, to talk about what the story is not about. Although this, this story, I mean, it's hard because today's text reads, Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So you would assume that this story was a, a, a message about kings. Because today's assigned psalm, Psalm 72 reads, May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. And you add to that, we read, I mean, we sang, We three kings. So it is natural for us to associate the Epiphany story with kings, right? No. It's not a story about kings. They weren't kings. They were magi. Magi comes from the Persian magos, a category of fire priest of Midian origin, responsible for political, religious worship and purity ceremonies. Now, even though magos, the root word, um, comes from magician, well, they were not magicians in the modern sense of the word. Rather, the word refers to a religious Figure. So, magi had wisdom from another reality. So, wise men is an appropriate translation. Now, I hate to shatter the common myth, but there were not three of them. <gasps> now, one author writes that the number three is based on the only based on the slender piece of evidence that they gave Jesus three gifts: gold frankincense, and myrrh, though that proves nothing. In his book, Revelation of the Magi, The Lost Tale of the Wise Men's Journey to Bethlehem, theologian Brent Landau presents the ancient account of the wise men who journeyed to Bethlehem to greet the birth of Jesus. The Revelation of the Magi offers the first ever English translation of of an ancient Syriac manuscript written in the second to third century, and this had been safeguarded in the Vatican Library ever since. So Landau delivers an invaluable source of information to the world interested in learning more about the nativity and the life of Jesus. And the indication, based upon the documentation, suggests that there could have been as few as 12 and as many as a score of magi. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Okay then. So I may have shattered what tradition has taught us about this well-known, greatly loved story, and I suppose I could push it a little bit further by mentioning the biblical scholarship of Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. In their book, The First Christmas, What the Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Birth, Borg and Crossan write, quote, In our judgment, there was no special star, no wise men, and no plot by Herod to kill Jesus. So is the story factually true? No. But as a parable, is it true? For us as Christians, the answer is a robust affirmative. Is Jesus' light shining in the darkness? Yes. Do the Herods of this world seek to extinguish the light? Yes. Does Jesus still shine in the darkness? Yes. Unquote. Wow. What comes to my mind at this point is, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
which is to say that I am not suggesting that we eliminate the entire story simply because tradition has taught us one thing and there are differing scholarly opinions on many of the details. So does this story, as a parable or historic reality, have something to say to us today? I think it does. If Epiphany is seeing the world and life in it with new eyes, what is being revealed to us as we hear this familiar story once again? Where do we find God's work in the world and how do we experience God's blessing? What does the story tell us, the star, the magi? Now, the first Christians asked the, these questions. What did the star mean? In the Hebrew scriptures, book of Isaiah helped them find the answer. Isaiah said that all nations and all kings and all peoples and all races would come to worship Christ that the star shines over all. Yes, the star shines over all people. God's love revealed in the star is for everyone. So it's not confined to a select few. So that is why this church voted to become an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. The church's ONA statement developed highlights a welcome of all persons of every age, background, circumstance, ethnicity, family configuration, gender identity, and sexual orientation. You'll find our ONA statement on the back of the bulletin. What else does the star over Bethlehem mean for us today? Laurel Matheson writes, our scriptures invite us to consider to, or to reconsider how Christ was manifest to the Gentiles now and how we might witness to the same light in concert with those stories now. That phrase of that sentence that Matheson Writes, and we discussed this in the Christian Century conversation this past week. That phrase has stuck with me all week. How we might witness to God's light here now. So the, the star of Bethlehem said and says that God's love is for all people, all races. So that is why our Justice Committee works to support Black Lives Matter, No Room for Hate, Stop Asian Hate, and other justice initiatives. We are fully committed to full inclusion to support the self-determination of those who have been marginalized and silenced. I look forward to our conversation on justice following worship this morning. Our light shines by our wise mental health ministry team who are providing education and moving us toward courageous conversations to end the stigma of mental illness. Now, many people would want to would like God to eliminate the, the dark, depressing times in life. I mean, I gotta tell you, God never promised to take away our darkness. God didn't promise that there wouldn't be darkness in the world. What God did promise was that we would be, giving, be given light. Light to help us live in this murky world of ours, a, a shadowy world that resulted in a violent assault on our government a year ago. The prophet said, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness shall blanket the earth. I get it. 
life continues to be overwhelmingly gloomy. Certainly living through COVID isn't a walk in the park. The list on our prayer list of who we know has COVID is growing. In the midst of our dimly lit world, our challenge is to keep our eyes focused and lit, focused on the eternal light of Jesus, the one we follow. So when we hear Isaiah's words, arise, shine, for your light has come. Or as Eugene Peterson puts it, get out of bed, Jerusalem, wake up, put your face in the sunshine, God's bright glory has risen for you. Now the Magi sought a vastly different kind of king from the one they found. Their gifts were costly and rare, while the recipient was a baby of humble birth. Now Matthew tells us that Herod summoned the, the scholars from the east and pretended that he wanted to worship this new king as well. This man who symbolized the whole religious political establishment wanted the baby killed and ordered every male child under two murdered. But something happened to these learned magi, strangers, non-Jews, who came and found Jesus. They too believed that he was born king of Israel. Something significant happens when the Magi find the child. Something that our tradition, the pageants, the carols, and all our epiphany celebrations don't necessarily highlight. If you look in the text, the Magi do not immediately present their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. No text says that the first thing that they do upon entering the house and seeing Mary and the child is to kneel and worship. Only after this act of worship, only after giving themselves completely to Christ, do they present their material gifts. These magi somehow became men of faith. This was no longer an intellectual pursuit of following the star, but, matter, but rather their hearts had now been changed. And now their lives would be changed. When they returned to their homes, they did not go back to Jerusalem to tell Herod they returned home another way. An epiphany is finding God in the midst of apparent dark places around us. So my message is simply this. The whole point of epiphanies is that they change us. And that by being changed, we cannot go back the place where we started. Epiphanies change us, and as changed people, we can't go back to the way things were. Think about that and the future of the church in these changing times. How we might change and how those changes might direct us in a different path than what we know of it. what we know. I mean, let's be honest, these are challenging times. Times a colleague of mine refers to as loose gravel. Thanks, Jonna. The church today does not look like it did decades ago. In my upcoming annual report to the church, 
I write that we faced continued challenges in 2021, but this has not dampened our spirits. Our faith is firm and the measure of our ministry is through the lens of love. What is our epiphany from today's scripture reading? What does it mean for us? Post Christmas, we return to the familiar, even the mundane, but we do so by a different path. Most of us are more like the Magi than we are the shepherds. Although I remember Rod McDonald saying last year that isn't there a little bit of Herod in each of us? Spiritually speaking, it's a long way from, the, from where we live day by day to the manger. We have to travel some distance to get there. The good news of Jesus Christ may seem to be a mirage that lies on the horizon and disappears just as we are about to approach it. Epiphany urges us to leave Bethlehem behind and to follow Christ on a journey. I mean, we're changed now by our epiphany. We're going on a journey. Are we ready for the ride? I know we never tire of hearing the, the familiar stories of our faith. I mean, each week we come to worship, we discover new insights. We look, we look for new insights week after week. We're looking for those new epiphanies and trying to figure out ways in which we can witness to the one we follow, bringing the light of God's love in the midst of this crazy world of ours. If we have taken time to come to the manger this year, we can't go back from the way we started. We are changed people, changed meaning, changed relationships. Differences may not be dramatic, but I pray that the message is planted somewhere within us. You see, walking away from the Magi in this season of Epiphany will lead us to a new path, a, a new way of living God, in God's world. Living in God's world here today with a sense of curiosity and faithfulness. So may we too be like the Magi to, to let go of the safe and familiar and embrace a much larger truth. Christ is born in Bethlehem. May Christ be born in our hearts as well. Amen.